This sermon is titled The Divine Exchange, The Cross of Jesus Christ, Part 1. Be enriched as you listen. All right. So we are approaching this time of the year that we typically say Good Friday and Easter. Uh, it's good during those days to look and reflect on the cross and what Jesus did for us on the cross and uh, the resurrection. Now, of course, we live in the reality of the finished work of Jesus and his resurrection every day of the year, every moment of every day. But it's good to just look back, look at, be reminded of what has happened, what Christ did for us on the cross. And leading up to that today and next Sunday, we're going to do a two-part sermon series called The Divine Exchange. The Divine Exchange. Exchange. Now, this message is not necessarily new. Uh, we've probably heard, of, heard this message several times. But I want to kind of break this down so that we can dive a little deeper into this. And hopefully, as we do that, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross will become that much more real to each of us. And I also want to emphasize a little bit more on the application of the application of what he did for us. So let's probably spend more time doing that. Now, just one word here. Uh, a lot of what we're saying is ba is backed up by scripture. Uh, we will not have time to turn to all the verses on a Sunday morning because we have only 40 minutes or so. But we will make all of this available to you. Uh, the sermon notes are already available, but the scripture reference and all of that, we will make it available to you so you could go back and look at it in depth if you wish to do that. But uh, we'll be just giving the essence of these things. The story of the Bible is really a story about God coming after us, men, people. We, in our own rebellion, wandered away from God, but God comes after us. And in coming after us, God did something that really astounds us, it shocks us. Almighty God, who is holy and who is perfect, He stepped in to where we were. He stepped into our place. To become what we were. So that he could give to us what he wanted us to have. And so we want to begin with this verse which we quoted earlier. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. The Bible tells us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about how gracious Jesus was. That though he was rich... Yet for our sakes, he became poor so that we, through his poverty, by, might be made rich. Now the context of that verse, we will come back to it next Sunday towards the end of the sermon. But I want us to look at it from the big picture perspective for now. What is it saying? He was rich, but he became poor. He chose to become something that we were, but he was not. He was rich, but he chose to become poor. So that through what he did in becoming poor, we could have what he had. And this is what we call as the divine exchange. He became what we were so that we could have what he had. The divine exchange. He was the sinless one. We were the sinful. He was the obedient. We were the disobedient. He was the faithful. We were the unfaithful. He was the beloved. We were the condemned. And yet, 
He chose to swap places with us. So the cross of Jesus is this one moment in time where Almighty God swap places with you and me. So I'll take your place. I'll become what you are because I want to give you what I have. And that's what happens on the cross. And so we can capture it in these words. For our eternal death, He gave us eternal life. For our guilt, He gave us forgiveness. For our sin, He gave us righteousness. For our cursing, He gave us blessing. For our judgment, He gave us favor. For our rejection, He gave us adoption. For our sickness, He gave us healing. For our brokenness, He gave us wholeness. For our shame, He gave us glory. For our oppression, He gave us dominion. For our slavery, He gave us kingship. For our hell, He gave us heaven. For our poverty, He gave us His provision. This is the great exchange. And this was all orchestrated by God Himself. Amen? A to Z, start to finish, God said, I'll do it for you. And then he said, here it is. My grace, my mercy, I'm giving to you. You just have to receive it by faith. Receive it by faith. And so, I want to break this down a little bit. Talk about each of these. And then emphasize the application of it because I believe God wants us to live in what He did for us. What is the use of paying such a great price if all we do is sing about it, talk about it, but we don't live in it? That's not... That would not satisfy the heart of God. He would want us to walk in the fullness of what Christ gave to us. And then he would be satisfied. So, for our death, he gave us eternal life. The first thing. We'll cover a few today. We'll do a few next Sunday. So we have eternal life through his death. So, the understanding is quite simple. We were the ones who sinned. The result of sin is death. The soul that sins will die. Sin is threefold. It is a separation from the life of God. It is physical death. And it is eternal death in hell. So the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, that he tasted death for every man. Where we were, he stepped in. We were the ones who were guilty. We were, had the sentence of death on our lives because of sin. And he stepped in and said, I'll take your death. I'll take it. He didn't have to. His life. And can you imagine the one who is life? He said, I am the resurrection and life. I am the life. The one who is the life being inflicted with death. And he said, I'll do it for our sakes, for your sakes. I'll do it. So that through what he did, he could offer us eternal life. And so we know the scripture, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God is giving us a gift. It's eternal life through Jesus because he took our death. He took it. He tasted death for every man. He tasted death for you. He took your death and said, 
You don't have to have it. I give you eternal life. But what I want to impress on our hearts is this. You see, many of us believe this, but we postpone eternal life to some time after we are lowered six feet down. In our minds, eternal life starts after that. But I want to bring our attention to this truth that eternal life starts the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. That moment... Eternal life comes into your being. That moment, death has no more claim on you. The Bible says we have passed from death to life. Or that means we've been transferred from death to life. It's done. And so eternal life for you and me begins the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. That means you have eternal life. The Bible says, he who has the Son has life. Not going to have, but you have. John wrote, he said, I'm writing this to you that you who believe in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may know that you have eternal life. You have eternal life. So let's say this together. I have eternal life. But I want us to understand, what does eternal life in you do? Is it only a preservation for heaven? Or does it matter here and now? I want us to understand it matters for us here and now. How does it matter? John chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. John writes, he says, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. In him was life. That life is in you. And what does it do for you? It fills you with light. Next verse, verse 5. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot overpower it. That means eternal life in you dispels darkness out of you. Here and now. So let's say this, let's say this together. Eternal life in me. Come on, say it like you mean it. If you don't believe it, <laughs> say it like you believe it. Eternal life in me dispels darkness out of me. Because the Bible says his light, his life is the light of men. That means it fills men with light. His life in you fills you with the light. You are a bright person. And His life in you, His light shining in you, dispels darkness out of you. His light shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot overpower it. What is darkness in those scriptures? Darkness represents two things. It represents the world, and it represents the works of Satan. Demonic works. That means eternal life in you is driving out darkness out of you. Nothing of this world and nothing of the devil can overpower you because you've got the life of God inside you. You've got eternal life in you. Amen? So eternal life is not, okay, I am going to go to heaven. Yes, you are. But eternal life in you is doing something in you right now. Is dispelling darkness out of you. Amen? And so you and I need to believe it. Of course we are in darkness. Of course the world around us is in darkness. And of course the devil around us is in darkness. But even he tries to crawl into your life and try to turn off the light, put darkness in you, you say, no, his life in me is the light of me. His life shines in me and drives darkness out of me. I will not tolerate any sin, anything of this world, any work of the enemy to dominate my spirit, soul, or body because God has given to me His eternal life and Jesus Christ tasted death so that I could have life, so that you could have life. Amen? One more thought. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it 
as much as you want, abundantly. So look at the context. He's saying, the thief is coming some, to do something to you, but I've got an antidote. I've got a big answer for it. I've given you life, and this life in abundance, and this life undoes or it reverses everything the thief comes to do. Meaning, eternal life in you is going to keep the devil from stealing, killing, and destroying. The thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. But he says, I'm giving you eternal life. Now, what's the point of having eternal life and the devil coming and stealing, killing, destroying? I have eternal life, but the devil stealing, killing, and destroying. Hey, the whole purpose of him giving you and me eternal life is so that the devil cannot steal, kill, and destroy. It's coming in answer to what the devil is doing. And this is God's answer. My eternal life in you. And you can have it in abundance. Amen? So eternal life in you makes sure that no matter what the devil does to steal, kill, and destroy, those things are nullified. They will not prevail. Because you've got the Zoe life of God. You've got the eternal life of God in you. Amen? So let's say this together. God's life in me reverses everything the devil does. He cannot steal, kill, or destroy. Amen? You have eternal life. Believe in what Christ has given you. Believe in the life of God in you. Second, I've got to move fast. We could spend a lot of time on each of these. The second thing, through the divine exchange, what is ours? We are forgiven through Him being made guilty. So, as we said, we were the ones who sinned so we, and sin has to be paid for. God is a righteous God, a just God. And there is a penalty for sin. So you and I are guilty before the throne of God. There's a debt that we owe. We are guilty. And not only that, but sin does a lot of other things. Sin separates us from God. Sin blocks the blessings of God. Sin holds us in its cords, enslaves us. All of these things are the result of that. Sin at work in our lives. So we are guilty and we also have the consequences of sin. But the Bible says on the cross, and you and I are familiar with, with this truth, that on the cross, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, he was Wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to our own sinful ways. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So think about this again. The sinless one, he gets into our place. And all our sin, our transgressions, our iniquities are put upon him. And he's there bearing all our sin. All our transgressions. And he paid for it. The debt we owed, he paid. As though he had, he owed all of that. He paid. And so the Bible says... He is, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. He is the payment for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And because of that, verse 12, 1 John 2, 12, your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. So till that, we are all good. Meaning, we all believe that. I believe I'm forgiven. You believe you're forgiven. But... The problem is this, we don't fully grasp forgiveness. And I want us to pu want to push us into two things, think two things to think about. You see, when God forgives, He also forgets. The scripture says, He 
things like this. He has buried our sins in the depths of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He says, though your sins were like scarlet, I will wash them white as snow. And he says this, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. Now that's an area many of us may not have stepped into. Because though we believe we are forgiven, we keep reminding ourselves. We keep reminding ourselves of our sins and we want to go and remind God. And God says, I've forgotten. I've already forgotten. And we're reminding God, Lord, God says, I've forgotten. So how about you and I learning to forget our own sins? I'm not saying go back and do all the wrong things. That's not the point. I'm just saying forgive yourself because God's forgiven you. Let it go. It's gone. He's taken, he's removed your sins. And he says, I, your sins, your iniquities, I will remember no more. So that's one area. I want to encourage us. Maybe somebody here needs to forget because God has forgotten. Secondly, forgiveness means there is mercy on your life. You see, sin has its consequences because the law is we will reap of what we sow. But mercy, the Bible says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy overrides judgment. Think about it. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So the mercy of God keeps us from receiving the judgment we actually deserve. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy keeps us from receiving what we do deserve. And forgiveness means mercy. There's mercy on your life and mine. Some people are living in the fear of judgment. Not only have they not been able to accept God's forgiveness and forgive themselves, but they're also living in the fear of judgment but understand mercy forgiveness means there is mercy on your life and mercy triumphs over judgment i'm talking about here and now in this life there's a mercy of god on over you in other words because of god's forgiveness you and i don't always reap of what we sow that's why the Bible says it's because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because if all of us had to reap of what we've sown, we would have been gone a long time ago. But it's because of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. This is forgiveness. And it was made possible because of the cross, the divine exchange. Amen? Number three. You say, how many points do you have, Pastor? We'll find out. <laughs> I shouldn't tell because you might tune off. Right? Number three. Righteous through him being made sin. Now, this is a message the last two Sundays we've been dealing with. So, another result of our sin was we had no standing at all before God. God is so holy, we are sinful. No standing. You can't even look at the face of God. No standing in His presence. The Bible says that sin was such a barrier between God and us that He even couldn't hear our prayer. No standing before God. But this is what happened on the cross. 
the place of divine exchange. Second Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us so that we should become the righteousness of God in Christ. We've been talking about this the last two Sundays. So try to think about this. The one who knew no sin, he stepped into your place and mine, you and I, and if you want to imagine this, you and I, but the ones with dirty, filthy rags. And God takes our dirty, filthy rag and puts it on Jesus so that he could take his pure white robe and put that on you and me. That means right now, as a believer in Jesus, you are clothed with a pure white robe of his righteousness. You don't have a dirty, filthy robe anymore. That was taken away on the cross. For many of us, in our minds, we are in somewhere in between. We agree, okay, I don't have a dirty, filthy robe. But my robe has been laundered. It went to the washing machine, came back. There's still some dirt on it. So we think like that. But I want to help change your thinking. You don't have a robe that went into the laundry machine and came back. You have a robe that never knew sin. Because you have a robe of His righteousness. Amen? Him who knew no sin, He made sin for us so that we should become the righteousness of God in him. You have a robe of righteousness. God's righteousness. Amen? And that's why you and I can go into the very presence of God. We can stand before God, look at him and say, God, I love you. We are welcome in his presence. And we can uh, look at God and say, God, I'm here in your presence and feel no sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation. Not because of our goodness, but because we believe in the divine exchange. He took my filthiness so that he could give me his righteousness. And I'm standing before God in that robe of righteousness. And when the devil comes to accuse us, he says, hey, too late. I'm in his robe of righteousness. There is therefore now no condemnation against me. When you and I face the challenges of life, you know God is for you 100%. Because he has nothing against you. He's on your side. So there's not an iota of doubt in your mind. Oh, God is fighting with me. God is not fighting with you. He's fighting for you. He's on your side. Amen? Number four. I promise you, we're getting to the end. We are blessed through him being cursed. So this is again something we saw recently. The law resulted in curses for disobedience. And the fact is, if you break one of the law, it's as good as breaking all the commandments. And so all of us are lawbreakers in the eyes of God. Because none of us could keep the law. And so curses or the curse of the law is upon our lives. What do the curses do? And you read Deuteronomy 28 verse 15 to 61. It simply says that it, it's destructive, destroys our lives. Every part of our lives are destroyed. Because of the curse. Physically, emotionally, family, financially, socially, every aspect 
of human life is destroyed because of the curse. But this is the divine exchange. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Now think about that. The one who is the source of all blessing would step into your place and my place and say, put all the curse that was supposed to go on them, put it on me. He became a curse. Why? So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. Gentiles. Which means every curse was borne by Jesus on the cross. And so there is no curse over your life as a believer in Jesus. Because he bore it all. And the blessing of God over every area of our lives was released on us. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, family, socially. Every area of your life is under the blessing of God. Do you believe that? Let's say it together. Every area of my life is under the blessing of God. Because the curse was born on, the, on Calvary's cross. He took it so that the blessing of God will come upon you and me. Amen? See, sometimes we are afraid. Oh, somebody will do black magic. Somebody will do witchcraft. Somebody is speaking evil of me. They're cursing me. See, you can't prevent them from what they're doing. But you don't have to worry whether the fear, whether that curse is going to come on you. Is that curse greater than the blessing of God? Is that curse greater than what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross when he took upon himself every curse? You and I need fear nothing. In the Old Testament, you read about this king Balak. He called Balaam and he said, can you curse Israel for me? And Balak, Balaam said, how can I curse those whom God has blessed? And he said, there is no witchcraft. There is no divination that can prevail against Israel. If that was true for people under the old covenant, how much more it will be true for people under the new covenant. So have no fear. Just declare, you are blessed by God. Every curse was removed on Calvary's cross. The divine exchange took place. Please fasten your seatbelts. We'll be landing shortly. Point number five. We are favored through him being condemned. All of these trace back to the root issue of sin. Sin at work in our lives put us in a place of enmity with God. If you're going to be on the opposite side of anyone, it shouldn't be the opposite side of God. But that's where we found ourselves. We were en enemies with God. And the Bible says, teaches us that we were people who were living according to the flesh. And if we live according to the flesh, we cannot please God. Just cannot. So we had a problem. Even if we wanted to, sin so dominated our flesh, we couldn't even get ourselves anywhere close to being pleasing to God. We were enemies with God. But on the cross, the place of divine exchange, God did something powerful. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, 
The Bible says, God condemned sin in Christ's body. So in the body of Christ, He not only bore our sins, but sin itself was dealt a crushing blow by Almighty God. God condemned sin in the body of Christ. So that the Bible tells us that the power of sin was broken. Romans 6 verse 6. The power of sin was broken. So that you and I can live in the blessings of that. That means you and I are free from the power of sin. We live by the Spirit and we do what's pleasing in the eyes of God. We are favored and we live a life that's pleasing in the eyes of God. In Romans 5 verse 10, 11, 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. We were enemies, but now we are friends with God. Say, I'm friends with God. Say a little happy. I'm friends with God. <laughs> See, we were enemies, but we were reconciled. How? Through the death of Jesus Christ. You have been put in a place of friendship with God. You're favored. You're favored. And you can live in that place of favor. Sixth one, the last one. The last demonic saints that we're going to look at today. We'll look at a few more next Sunday. We are adopted through him being rejected. So again... God created Adam and Eve to be his son and daughter. Luke 3.38 says Adam was a son of God. He was created in that relationship with God. God was his father. But because of sin, he lost that place. He lost that place in the family of God. He lost that place in the presence of God. Banished. And to make matters worse, Satan became his father. Jesus told them, you are of your father the devil and the deeds of your father you will do. And the spirit of disobedience was at work in each of us. So we were out of place. We were orphans. Our true father is God. But Satan tried to fill that place. And each of us could, can feel that we are orphaned, out of place, forsaken, rejected. And here comes the eternal word, the one who was with God for eternity. Stepping into this world as the son of God. Going to the cross. And on the cross, he steps into your place and mine. As people who've been forsaken or rejected in a place like that. And this one was one with the Father on the cross. The Bible says he was rejected by men and he was forsaken by the Father. He would cry out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? That was not his place. All eternity he was one with the Father and the Spirit. So close. And here on the cross, he was forsaken. He, was, he stepped in to where we were. Though he was rich, Yet for our sakes, he became poor. Stepped into where we were. Forsaken, rejected. But he did it for this reason. So that you and I could be adopted into the family 
of God. You and I could become sons and daughters of God. You and I could be embraced by the Father and say, you are now in my family. Amen. Worship team, please come. We no longer serve the devil. We no longer are driven by a spirit of disobedience, but you and I have the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit who makes us sons and daughters of God, and we cry out, Abba, Father. But this was made possible because of the divine exchange. That he would become what we were, forsaken, orphaned, so that he could bring us to where he is in the family of God. What I want to impress on us is this. The divine exchange has happened. It is not going to happen. It has already taken place. And you and I are beneficiaries. We should live in the reality of what Jesus Christ has already done for us. Live in it. Because he finished the work. Live in it. I'll just quick, quickly review. These six exchanges we spoke about today. We'll continue this next Sunday. Let's say this together. We have eternal life through his death. All right, let's say it together, all right? We have eternal life through his death. We are forgiven through him being made guilty. We are righteous through him being made sin. We are blessed through him being cursed. We are favored through him being condemned. We are adopted through him being rejected. This work is finished. It's done. Every blessing of the cross, every provision is yours and mine to walk in. Amen? By this time, you should be on jumping on your chairs. <laughs> Let's stand to our feet, please. We want to thank God. Lord, thank you for the divine exchange. That the God of glory would step into our depraved state, our poverty-stricken state, becoming what we were, taking our place, for our sakes so that through what he did we could receive only what he could give only what he could give but we must receive it by faith it's given to us freely by grace but we must receive it by Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in what He has done for you. Like we say many times, or we say often, no religion can give this for us. No pastor, no religious man or woman can do this for you. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And He did it. 2,000 years ago did the work but you and I must come and receive and say yes Lord I believe it this Jesus who was crucified on the cross he was buried and the Bible says third, the third day he rose up again he ascended into heaven he's alive and he welcomes everyone who comes to him and says Lord I believe I receive. This morning, maybe there's some, there could be people here 
and you never have received Jesus Christ into your life. You never came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe in you. I believe what you did for me on the cross. I received this for myself. Maybe you've never done this in your life. And this morning, I want to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you have never received what Jesus did for you personally, I'm not talking about the person on your right or your left. I'm talking about you. If you personally have never received this for your own life, telling Jesus that you believe in Him and you believe in what He did for you on the cross, then this is your moment. This is your opportunity to do that. And if you're watching online and if you've never done this before, we invite you to do this right now. I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you've never prayed a prayer like this where you said, Lord Jesus, I receive you in my life. I believe in what you did for me and I receive it. Then this is the moment. Just pray this prayer with me if you would like to. If you've never done this before, you could say this with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I believe you took my sins on the cross. You took my place and I receive you into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me to live for you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says to all who received him to receive Jesus to them he gives the power to become the children of God so this moment if you pray this prayer with me and you receive Jesus this moment he has made you a child of God and we want to celebrate with you if you pray this prayer with me for the very first time we want to see your hand if you don't mind, could you raise your hand? Is there anyone here in this auditorium? You pray this prayer with me for the very first time. We want to see your hand. We want to celebrate with you. Anybody here? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. I want to see your hand. Anyone here? Pray, prayed with me for the very first time. Anyone? Just wave your hand at me. Okay. I don't see any hand. I don't see. I'm assuming that means all of us in this building have already received Christ. But in case you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time, I just a little side to raise your hand. On your way out, you'll find our ushers holding a green bag. It's what we call as a new believer's bag. So if you pray the prayer with me for the first time today, on your way out, just stop by with one of the ushers and say, you know, I want to receive that bag because I prayed that prayer and I'd like to grow in my faith in Jesus Christ. So please do that online. Please get in touch with us. Go to our church website at the URL that's shown there and let us know you pray that prayer and we'll be able to reach out to you and share these resources with you. We're going to take, some, take a few moments just to worship God. And as we worship, I want you to say, Lord, I thank you for the divine exchange. I thank you for what Jesus did for me on the cross. I receive it. I want to walk in it. I want my life to show what Jesus did on the cross. Let's take a few moments just to look to the Lord, please. Jesus, we praise you, God. We praise you. We worship you. And you deserve the glory. As we lift your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name for you. 
Father, you said in your word that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon your people. And so, Father, right now, on the authority of your word, I speak over every person here, every home, every individual, every home, every family, every marriage. And I declare that every area of our lives come under the blessing of God. Anything and any, everything that attempts to destroy is banished, is expelled. That everything in our lives is under the blessing of God. That our bodies and our minds are blessed our homes are blessed. The marriages are blessed. Our finances are blessed. That we are blessed coming in, blessed going out. Father, even now in the name of Jesus, release healing into bodies that may be suffering. Because healing is your blessing for your people. So in the name of Jesus, release healing. As you're standing here, I want to encourage you. Just lay your hand on that part of your body you want Jesus to heal. And say, Lord, I receive my blessing. God's word says, by his stripes, we were healed. By his stripes, we were healed. So he bore the wounds that bring healing for Lord, let the blessing of healing be released into people's bodies, even now in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing. That's your blessing. I speak the blessing of God over every home and every family. I declare that whatever the enemy tries to do to steal, to kill, to destroy, families and homes and marriages will stop. Because we are under blessing. The life of God in us dispels darkness. 
Let every home be filled with the life of God. Because God has given you eternal life. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father. And Lord, we pray for people who may feel alone, orphans, rejected. May today you experience favor, a sense of divine favor, knowing that you are accepted in the beloved. You are adopted in the family. You are not forsaken. God is for you. God is on your side. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your healing, virtue. Thank you for your grace flowing into every life and every home and every family, God. Thank you. Let joy, let the blessing of joy, let the blessing of laughter come into the hearts and lives of people. For some, that's what you need. You need the blessing of laughter. It's been a long time since you laughed. But may the Lord fill you, removing all that causes you to feel oppressed and depressed, and let the joy of the Lord cause you to laugh again, to enjoy your journey. To enjoy life. Let the joy of the Lord come in. Fill your mouth with laughter. We thank you, Father. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. Thank you. Thank you. Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.